All right, take your Bibles, please. Turn to 3 John. 3 John. Last Sunday morning, we took the theme of this book, which is truth, and we ran some verses on truth. Last Sunday night, talked about joy. John is not only a loving saint, he is also a joyful saint. Uh, in the introduction, in the first few verses of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, uh, he talks about joy. Not only love, but, both, but joy also, and, and both, both are part of the fruit of the Spirit. And then to, uh, this morning, I want to take one word again out of this book, and run some verses on that, and that word is charity. Charity. Um, but let's uh, read verses 5 through 7, get the surrounding context. Third John, verse number 5. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for an opportunity to open up your word. Uh, <clears throat> Lord, it is a privilege to have your very words, the very book that you wrote, the very book that you wanted us to have. What a blessing that it is to have this before us now. Lord, may we uh, for a moment set aside uh, whatever may be vying for our attention or distracting us and help us to focus in on the preaching of your word. Please give us the help that we need and the instruction that we need. We'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise for it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The word for this morning is charity. Charity. Um, everything that has been taught in 1 John and then in 2 John about our love for the brethren and how God's love is supposed to work in our hearts and that love is supposed to not stay with us, but it's supposed to flow out from us to our brethren in Christ. All of that teaching material, all of that doctrine in 1 and 2 John all of that is summed up in one word, and that word is charity. Charity takes all that in, and, and we're going to look at it, this, uh, at it this morning. Charity is a term found exclusively in the New Testament. It's not found one time in the Old Testament. Every time you find the word, it's in the New Testament. And for the simple fact that uh, there were no Christians in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ had not come and shed his blood yet. Uh, God had his saints, he had people that put faith in him, but Jesus Christ had not shed his blood yet, the church had not begun yet, and so this, uh, this truth about one body in Jesus Christ, of which Christ is the head, that was not in existence before Christ came, and, and so you don't see this word charity uh, found in the Old Testament, you find it only in the New Testament, and charity is love. But it's more than love, it's a specific kind of love, and hopefully we'll all see that this morning. Charity is the love specifically between brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how the Bible uses it. Um, and uh, we'll get to 1 Corinthians 13 in a moment, uh, but 1 Corinthians 13 is the great charity chapter of the Bible. Now the modern versions change the word charity to love. But God uses love plenty of times in the Bible. He knows the difference between charity and love. If one place says love and another place says charity, God knows what he's talking about. But the problem in the Corinthian church was that they could not get along with each other. They were striving and contending and fighting with each other. And what they had need of was charity. Charity, that specific love between brothers and sisters in Christ because they're part of the same family the body of Christ. Um, th there's some, we'll look at some of these things more in, uh, in detail this morning, but just briefly, here's some of what the Bible says about charity. Charity 
is the pinnacle of spiritual growth. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. It's the pinnacle of spiritual growth. Number two, charity is the bond of perfectness. Colossians 3.14. It's the bond of perfectness. Without charity, we are nothing. 1 Corinthians 13.2. Without charity, we are nothing. Number four, of these three, faith, hope, and charity, charity is the greatest. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Number five, all things should be done with charity. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. All things should be done with charity. And then number six, there's more said about it, but I just chose out these six highlights. Number six, it is the end of the commandment. 1 Timothy 1.5. We'll talk about that a little bit this morning. It's the end of the commandment. So it's the pinnacle of spiritual growth. It's the bond of perfectness. Without it, we are nothing. Of faith, hope, and charity, charity is the greatest. All things should be done with charity. Charity is the end of the commandment. Charity out of a pure heart, that is. So an honest look at everything the Bible says about charity, none of us can say that we are good Christians if we don't have it. Not biblically. Not biblically. You can't look at all those things the Bible says about charity and think yourself to be a good, spiritual, mature Christian if you don't have it. Now, in light, and, and we're going to preach about charity this morning because it's in the Bible. It's my job to uh, not hold anything back to, but to preach all the counsel of God. But uh, in this struggle and in this battle, I'm right there with you. I have not attained... <laughs> I am not speaking from an elevated position as though I have acquired all this and, and you have yet to rise to my level. None of that. None of that. But God's put me here to preach this to you, but I'm right there with you, working on these things, trying to get better, trying to do better. But go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse number 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Virtue and the virtue knowledge, and then it goes on down the list. But first thing I want to say this morning is, are you saved through the blood of Jesus Christ? Like we sang about this morning, no other plea but the blood of Jesus Praise the Lord, that's the first step. You don't get that step, you can't go any further. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, what I mean by that is if there has never been a time in your life where you have turned from sin, which the Bible calls repentance, and put your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away your sins, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, He was buried and rose again the third day, and you've abandoned all hope and confidence in anything but that, because that's the only way to be saved. If you haven't done that, you have not yet begun. You don't have to worry about adding to your faith. You have not yet had the faith. You have not yet been saved. That's the first step. You've never been saved. You, you need to be saved. That's number one. But to those of you who have been saved, the Bible says you're supposed to add to your faith. And as I talk to people, and I'm as sure as you talk to people and try to tell them about the Lord as I knock on doors here in Ledyard. You know, I've noticed knocking on doors here in Ledyard. There's an awful lot of people that at least have the testimony of being saved. They really do. Now, I couldn't tell you which ones are really saved and which ones aren't. have no idea. Number one, I can't see the heart. But number two, there's not much difference between the saved people how they live and how the lost people live. And some of them say they're saved and some of them say they're not. But uh, for the most part, I can't really tell much of a difference. I, I knock on the door. Are you saved? Yes, I am. When did you get saved? Uh, 1996, 1984, 2007. Praise the Lord. Are, are, you, are you glad someone's out here telling sinners about Jesus Christ? 
Apparently not. <laughs> you interested in talking about this more? I mean, I mean, it's not too, not probably not every day that somebody knocks on your door trying to preach the gospel. Uh, no, not really. So they may or they may have gotten saved. That's between them and the Lord. I have no idea. But if they have gotten saved, they haven't added much to their faith. They act like, I'm saved, so what's there to talk about? Salvation is not the end. Salvation is the beginning. From there, you're supposed to add some things to your faith. So it says in verse 5, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So charity is the height. That's the top of the list. I mean, what's the starting point? Faith in Jesus Christ. From there, what are you supposed to do? Add. What are you supposed to add? Well, number one, virtue. Uh, then knowledge, to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, to, not, uh, to temperance, patience, patience, godly, uh, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So guess what? Charity is, again, it's the pinnacle. It's the height of spiritual maturity. That's the last step on, on the list here. So, but here's, here's, here's the mistake and here's the error that so many modern Christians make. They, they see this, and they acknowledge this, that charity is higher than virtue and knowledge and temperance and godliness and all the, all the other things. They say charity is the top, so you know what they do. They act like everything else is, is not important. The only thing that matters is charity because charity is the top. Charity is the greatest. So don't worry about knowledge. Don't, stu don't study your Bible. Don't worry about the other things. I mean, all we need is love. <laughs> All we need is charity, but here's what they don't understand. Charity is the top rung in the ladder. Well, you can't get to the top step without taking all the other steps. It's a process. You can't start there, but that's where it's supposed to end. The Bible says, take, take for example, it says in verse 5, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So someone says, well, knowledge is way down on that list. I think what's more important is charity. So I'll just, I'll just love people. I won't worry about reading my Bible. I won't, study, I won't worry about studying my Bible. I'll have the main thing. I'll have the top thing. But you can't skip the process. You can't skip steps. You're supposed to add this to this and this to this and this to this because charity without knowledge ends up being perversion. It's not real love. It's not true love. What was it? I, I think it was either 2014 or 2015. If my memory serves me right, the Supreme Court said states are no longer allowed to block sodomites, not homosexuals. The Bible word is sodomites. They're no longer to, allowed to block sodomites from getting married. Everybody has to allow it. Every state has to allow it. And, and, and they showed people holding signs saying what? Love wins, right? <laughs> Maybe some of you are too young to remember that. But <laughs> love wins. No, love didn't win. Perversion won. Sin won. Iniquity won. But you know what they had? They had love, but they didn't have any knowledge with that love, so it wasn't true love. It was perversion. So you can't say, all I need is charity, I don't need knowledge. Without the knowledge, your charity will be misplaced. Your love will be misplaced. You, don't, you won't know what to love. You won't know what to hate, what to love. You'll be all out of balance. Look at, take another one for example. It says in verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience. Patience, godliness. You know, another th thing on the list is patience. Well, guess what? If you just try to have charity, but you don't have any patience, you'll, you might start out trying to have patience, or you might start out trying to have charity, but it won't last because <laughs> people require patience. Okay, I'm going to be charitable. And it lasts about five seconds till someone gets on your nerves. Now you don't have any charity anymore. You need patience. 
So this is a process, and you don't start with charity, but that is the height. That's the pinnacle. It's charity. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So what does it all come down to? What does all that come down to? Every word of God is pure, and you need everything God had to say. You don't pick and choose, I think this is important, this is not important. Everything God says is important. Imagine standing before the Lord on Judgment Day, and He had given you a book, and you explained to Him why some parts of His Bible were important, and some of the things He wrote wasn't all that important. So you, you focus on some things, but you didn't worry about these things. I mean, imagine standing before the Lord on Judgment Day and saying that to Him. I mean, it's one thing to say that to somebody else. Imagine telling him that something he had to say wasn't that important. Everything God says is important. You need it all. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Now, 13, I, I, like, I like studying these things out, Bible numerology. Some people really take it into extremes and make things up that aren't there, but God does use numbers for reasons. 13, your Bible, if you, if you trace it out, if you study it out, is the number of rebellion. Um, and say, why is, why is this, why is charity, why is the chapter on charity in 1 Corinthians 13? Because it's a rebuke that they don't have any. 1 Corinthians 13, which has 13 verses in it, is a verse all about charity. It is a rebuke to the Corinthian church because they didn't have any charity. And uh, I would say that if God wrote an entire chapter describing one attribute, that's pretty important. Here's an entire chapter devoted to one thing, charity. Let's look at it a little bit here this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity... I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know what that is? Just a bunch of annoying noise. Now, here's the reality of the situation, folks. If we are going to uh, be part of this church for any length of time, months down the road, years down the road, you know what that requires from time to time? Hopefully not too often, but... Eventually, you know what it requires from time to time? A reproof or a rebuke. Hey, brother, I'm just, I just got to tell you, this, that's not right. <laughs> Sister, I just got to tell you, that's wrong right there. You know what that requires? It, ta- it requires admonishment. Sometimes it's not a rebuke or a reproof. Sometimes it's, it's exhorting. Like, come on, we got to do better. Come on, let's get moving. That, that is, that's required, that's necessary, that's in the Bible. We're never, we're never going to improve without it. We're not going to be perfected without it. Well, guess what? If I don't have charity to you, you are not going to receive that, though what I have to say may be absolutely true. And if you don't have charity towards me, when you try to correct me, though what you say very well may be true, I'm probably not likely to receive it because all that is is a bunch of noise. So guess what? If we don't have charity, we can never accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish. And you can't be perfected, and I can't be perfected. We can't ever, we can't ever get anywhere. We can all come together, and we can do one of two things. We can make, we can make a bunch of annoying noise if we don't have any charity, or we can all just shut our mouths because we know ahead of time it's not going to be accepted. (laughs) But either way, that's not a way to fellowship together. That's not a way to have church. How about we have charity, consistent, genuine concern one for another, and then on those rare occasions when someone does need a rebuke or someone does need admonishment or exhortation, guess what? It's still not a guarantee it'll be accepted, trust me. But guess what? It's more likely to be received. And you did your part. If you rebuke someone because they were wrong, but you didn't have charity, you can't say, I I did my part. You didn't do your part because you don't have any charity. (laughs) Just a bunch of noise. Look at verse number two. And though I have the gift of prophecy 
and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Pretty strong. Pretty strong statement. I understand all mysteries. I can, tell the, I can tell you the difference between the rapture and the church. I can tell you the difference, uh, the mystery of the, of the uh, uh, reconciliation of Israel. And all Israel will be saved. I can explain all that. I have all the knowledge. I believe the Bible. I have all faith. I can remove mountains. But if I don't have charity, I'm nothing. The Bible just, the Bible has a way of just giving us no excuse. I mean, if it, if it, if it said you're not a whole lot... If, you're, if it said you're not much, we might be okay with that. Okay, okay, I can deal with not being a whole lot. I can, I can deal with not being much. When it says I am nothing, if you have any desire at all to do right, if you have any desire at all to do better and to hear well done, thou good and faithful servant one day at the coming of the Lord, then the only response is, well, I got to get this. I have to have it. I can't do without it. If without it I'm nothing, I have to get it. One way or another, I have to get it. I am nothing. You know what it says in verse 2? Though I have all faith. Hold your finger here. We'll come back. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You know what that verse says? Faith works by love. If you don't have any love, faith doesn't work. You might have it, but it doesn't work. So what do you mean? Okay, I believe the Bible. I, I believe everything the Bible says. I have the knowledge. I have the faith. God's love is supposed to be in my heart. And, and, and I get love is of God. If I need love, i got to get it from God. And that love is supposed to work in my heart towards other people. I know that. I have the knowledge. I believe that. I have all faith. I have the faith. But if I don't love you, if you don't love me, Though you have the knowledge and you, though you have the faith, you will have no desire to use that knowledge. You will have no desire to use what you know and use what you believe. Yes, I know how it's supposed to work, but I really don't care to use it. I really don't care to put it into practice because I don't love that person. Faith works by love. If you don't have love, you might have faith, but it's not profiting. It's not helping. So we're looking at charity this morning. And you can look in your heart, and I can look in my heart, and guess what? We can learn all the facts about charity. And we can walk out of here this morning have a great, have a, having a greater understanding of charity. But if in our heart our love hasn't increased, and we don't really love, all we've learned is more facts. We have knowledge and we have faith, but it's not working. It's not working because there's no love. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. I am loving, I am charitable. Do you see what I just, do you see how much uh, money I just gave? You see the check I just wrote? That proves I am loving. That proves I am charitable. The Bible says you could give every dime you have in the world. That doesn't mean you have charity. The Bible says you could give all your goods to feed the poor and still not have charity. You can't write a check as a substitute for not getting your heart right. Now, God forbid a Baptist preacher should speak against giving, but <laughs> what the Bible is saying is uh, you can't buy off God. You can't say, I'm not going to get my heart right, but I'll write this check and that proves that I'm loving. That It doesn't prove that. You could give all your money to feed the poor, still not have charity. 
And then it says, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now, I, wouldn't make, I would never make this judgment call because <laughs> I can't see the heart. I would, I, would never, I would never look at a martyr and say, well, you didn't do that for the right, right reasons. I would never make that judgment. But guess what? The Lord would. The Lord would. You know what the Lord said? You could go as far as giving your body to be burned and suffering a martyr's death, and the Lord looks on your heart and said, maybe you just want to end up in some book. Of famous, preach, uh, famous Christians. Maybe you wanted to be in some roll call of faith. Maybe you wanted to say, everyone to say how great of a Christian you are. That doesn't mean you had charity. You know, uh, some of those uh, martyrs, you read about them, and the very people that are persecuting them, the very people they are killing, uh, that are killing them, they are, those martyrs go to death praying, some of them, they go to death praying for their persecutors, praying for the people that did that. Look, you know why? They want them to be saved. They are burning, I mean, you can read the accounts in Fox's Book of Martyrs, and, and, and uh, there's other ones out there. They are praying for the very people that are putting them to death. That's charity. Well, you could go through that and not have that attitude. You know what the Lord is saying? There is absolutely nothing you can do to substitute having charity. I don't care what you say you've done or what you say you've accomplished. Nothing is a substitute for charity. You could be a martyr burning on a stake and not have charity in your heart. The Bible says, profiteth nothing. Look at verse number 4. Charity suffereth long. Charity suffereth long. <sighs> Nobody wants to suffer. Really, I don't want to suffer a long time. <laughs> you know, for the people in this world, if you cause them to suffer, if you wrong them, usually it, all, it only takes one time they're writing you off. <laughs> usually one time and you're done. You know, charity suffereth long. You know why? Because if you have real charity in your heart and you really love someone and you're trying to help them, though they may cause you to suffer, you understand that this relationship is permanent. If you're saved, that is a permanent relationship. It's going to go on forever, so I'm not going to act as if, it's going to, if it's, as if it's not. It is permanent, and I am willing to put up with suffering because I'm really trying to help that person. Now, we do all understand this because probably there's at least one or two people in your life that you are willing to put up suffering. You are willing to put up with it for their sake. If you have children, they will cause you to suffer. Uh, if you have children, they will, uh, they will never be, uh, not probably while they're a child, as thankful as they should be for what you do for them and never show as much appreciation or, or even understand all, all that you are doing for them. And they will break your rules and all that stuff. But you put up with all that because you love them. So every, every one of us, we do understand the concept, but... What the Lord wants every one of us to do is take that love and instead of having it just for one or two select people in your life, have it to every member of the body of Christ. Expand it, not just for a few people that you really care about, but you're, you're, you're caring about everybody that's saved, everybody that's a brother and sister in Christ. It says in verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. And again, that adds another level to it because we can go through the motions and we can suffer it, but we can suffer it without being kind. We can suffer it because we're checking the block and when it falls apart so we can blame the other person because I, I did my part, <laughs> but there's no real genuine attempt to fix the relationship. It's not just suffering long, it's suffering long and is kind. It's genuine. 
Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Again, this, is, this, this chapter is in the whole context of Christians who can't get along with each other. Christians who are fighting with each other. That's the whole context of the book of 1 Corinthians. You know what charity does? It doesn't envy. In other words, here's someone I don't like. Here's someone that annoys me. Here's someone that gives me a problem. And God's blessing falls upon him. And everything goes well for him. Everything goes right for him. God, how can you bless them? They're annoying me. I don't understand. And you know what? You're okay with them being blessed. You're okay. In fact, you're happy that God is blessing them. You're happy that things are going well with them. You're not envying them. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. That's boasting, bragging, is not puffed up. So when someone disrespects you, when someone disrespects me, when they don't give us the utmost level of respect that we think we've achieved in our life, we take offense. And what do we do? Puff ourselves up. Don't, don't you know who I am? Yes, that's why they're saying what they're saying. <laughs> don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know what I've accomplished? And so it becomes a competition. Who's better? Who's stronger? Who's more spiritual? Who's this? And, and both people just get puffed up and, and bragging and boasting, and I've done this, and I've done this. Well, but isn't, isn't, the, Lord who won, isn't the Lord the one that helped you do anything you've ever done? Isn't, isn't it true that without Him we can do nothing? We're all willing to acknowledge that we can't do anything without Him, but as, someone, as soon as someone disrespects us, now all of a sudden we did it. Now all of a sudden we accomplished it. Now all of a sudden we got here by ourselves. Charity doesn't vaunt itself. It doesn't puff itself up because it knows, guess what? I'm just a sinner saved by grace just like you. And you can, you can disrespect me and all that, but that's not going to change my love for you. So verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. Can't we all look and act like great Christians while we're at church? But how about when you get home and someone crosses you? How about at school or at work and someone does something unkind to you? Isn't it amazing how quickly we can change? Uh, un unseemly, inappropriate, not proper, doesn't behave itself unseemly. Your conduct is not going to change me. You're not going to change me and put me back in the flesh. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Look at the next one. Seeketh not her own. Seeketh not her own. If you are only going to love people because what you get out of it in return, eventually you're going to stop loving people. Because nobody's ever going to give you what you think you have coming and what you think you deserve. But if you're, if you're being loving, if you're being helpful, if you're doing what good you are really solely for the benefit of that person, then if you don't get anything out of it, well, oh well, you didn't do it for yourself. You did it for them. So it's a heart check, heart check. I am, I'm helping someone, I'm being kind to them, I'm being good to them. Now I realize they haven't responded in a way I think they should respond. They haven't expressed enough gratitude or appreciation like I think I deserve. Now, now am I going to change or am I going to still be good to them? Because if I change, that's an evidence that it wasn't really about them, maybe partially, but it was also a lot about me and what I got out of it. Seeketh not her own. And then it says, is not easily provoked. Is not easily provoked. Some people, they just have a short fuse. It really doesn't take much to set them off because they are concerned with their convenience and their comfort and the way they want things. They're not concerned with the other person. And so it doesn't take much to set them off is not easily provoked. They're on a short leash. 
They better do things the way I want it done. <laughs> Not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. The less you love someone, when you begin to fall out of love with another brother and sister, all of a sudden, now there's suspicions about their Christian conduct that you never had before when you loved them. Now, they haven't changed. Your attitude has changed. And when everything was good, when you loved them, they were great Christians. And now you don't love them anymore. Now, now, now they're not a great Christian. Now they're probably sinning. Their Christianity doesn't rise and fall based on how you're feeling. Their spirituality doesn't rise and fall based on your love or your lack of love. You know what charity thinks? It doesn't think anything evil. It doesn't assume people believe evil report. They're more prone to believe evil reports of people that they don't really care about anyways. I don't have to bother to check that. <laughs> they probably did it. I don't have to bother to verify it. That's probably true. Why? Because there's a lack of love. There's a lack of charity. Thinketh no evil. Verse number six. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. You don't have this charity. You, you begin to hate someone. You will rejoice when they fall. You will rejoice when they sin. You're rejoicing in iniquity. Well, how can you rejoice? How can you take pleasure in something that Jesus Christ shed his blood for? Jesus Christ shed his blood for your sins and for their sins. How can you rejoice in iniquity, whether it's yours or theirs? Wherever it came from, it put Jesus on the cross. How can you rejoice in that? You're rejoicing in it because you're hoping they fall. And you're hoping that God stops blessing them. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. We won't turn there, but remember 3 John, in our, in our book, our, our, our book that are studying, John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You hate someone, you're going you're, you're, you're gonna to hope that they fall, and you're not going to rejoice when they're doing right. You hear a report, oh, this brother's a blessing, this brother helped me, this brother encouraged me. And instead of rejoicing, now you begin to hate that because you don't like them, and you can't stand that anyone else could be, that they could be a blessing to anybody else. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth. In the truth. If somebody is walking in the truth, you ought to rejoice in that. That's something to rejoice in. Verse number seven. Beareth all things. Beareth all things to put up with, to endure. Well, that's reality, folks. <laughs> we're, we're all sinners. We're all flesh. If you're going to stay in a relationship, you're going to stay in a loving relationship. Some things you're just going to have to put up with to a degree. Now, we're not talking about sin. We're, we rebuke sin. We call out sin, but none of us have arrived yet. You know what that means? That means we're going to have to bear some things. We're just going to have to put up with it. It is what it is. We're trying to get better, but we're not there yet. Now, if you don't have charity, you don't put up with anything. You just walk away from it. My life will be more peaceable without this. My life will be more enjoyable like this. I don't have to deal with this. I don't have to put up with this. I'm walking away. It'll be more ha I'll be more happy. It'll be more peaceful. But if you really love them, if you really have charity towards them, you put up with it because you're trying to help them, and they're your brother, and they're your sister. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. That's very similar to thinketh no evil, just the reverse. You believe the good you hear about him. You believe the good report. I don't have to verify. Well, I, he couldn't have possibly have been a blessing. Let me check that. No. Believeth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. So this is your honest heart's desire that things go well. It's like 3 John, again, he writes to Gaius and he says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. 
That's what I really want for you. That's what I really desire. Hoping all things. Hope if, if he really is a problem, if he, if he really is the problem you say you are, you hope he gets better. You hope he gets right. You hope he repents. You hope everything works out well. You're not hoping for destruction. You're hoping for his betterment. Hopeth all things, endureth all things. Ugh. I don't like it. I don't like enduring all things. You know what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2? He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, when I read that verse normally, I think of it in the context of the hardship we get from the world and the enemy and the attacks from the outside. Sometimes you have to endure hardness that comes from your own family in Christ. But you do endure it if you love them. Again, it's so much easier to walk away. I can get rid of all the annoying people in my life very easily. Just have nothing to do with them. Just quit. It's, it, it sounds so nice, right? In the flesh. It sounds so nice. I could fix all these problems. I'm just going to walk away. But that's not going to help them. That's not going to improve them. You endure it. Verse number 8. Charity never faileth. Never faileth. You know, there's people, the Bible describes, 1 Corinthians 5, other places, their conduct has been, become so bad and so sinful and so hurtful to the rest of the assembly that, that it's just, the Lord says, just don't even have fellowship with them. Proverbs says, make no friendship with an angry man. Just, just don't have fellowship. Don't have company. But the Bible says, charity never faileth. Even when that happens, you're still praying for them. Even when that happens, you'll still do good to them. Even when that happens, you're hoping they'll repent and hoping charity never faileth. Never. Never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, skip to verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is charity. You know why? Because guess what? One day Jesus Christ is coming back in the air. Praise the Lord. One, we're gonna, one day we're going to see him face to face. Guess what? When that day happens, you won't need faith anymore. He's right in front of you. You're not hoping anymore. Your hope's been fulfilled. There he is. No more need for faith. If you can see it, it's not faith. Well, one day you're going to see him. You don't have to hope anymore. One day he'll be there. What's going to go on forever? Charity. What doesn't have an expiration date? Charity. Faith has an expiration date. Hope has an expiration date when you see Christ. Charity doesn't have an exp expiration date. Charity goes on forever. Greatest of these is charity. Go with, me, go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Now read the context, find out what it's talking about, what it means, the end of the commandment. Verse 6, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. All right? Now, so what's the, what's the context? Commandments, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do this, right? Verse 5 says, now the end 
of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Here's what the Lord is getting at. Charity, if you don't have charity, you need the law. Because you need commandments to say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not do this. Because you wouldn't do that naturally because you don't have any charity, so you need the law. But if you have charity, there's nothing wrong with the law, but you don't need it because you're doing that already because you love them. So the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. I'll give you a cross-reference for this so you know that that's the meaning of it. Hold your finger here. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. All right? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, the commandment is thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. All the commandments that proves you guilty, what is it supposed to do for the sinner? It's supposed to bring them to the end where they realize, I can't measure up to God's standards. I don't measure up to His righteousness, and I need Jesus Christ to be my Savior. So Christ is the end of the law. When you reach the end, where does it bring you? Christ. Okay, so 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. You know what the Lord wants to bring every one of us to? He wants us to bring us to the place where we're not doing these things because we have to, but because we genuinely love people and we want to do it. Everything we read in 1 Corinthians 13, my flesh says, I don't want to do that. The Lord wants us, bring us, bring us to the place where that's what we want to do because we really do love that person. The end of the commandment. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 22, 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Not fake, not put on. Okay, we're supposed to love. Uh -huh. No, no, it's real, it's genuine. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart. And then that last Word even makes it more difficult, or it takes more Holy Spirit control, depending on how you look at it. Pure heart, fervently, fervently. Now you say that's impossible. It is impossible in the flesh. That's why the sentence isn't over. Colon, end of verse 22, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So guess what? You know what that means? That means none of the things we've talked about are about love and charity is, is possible in your flesh, in your willpower, tr power, trying harder next time, trying to do better next time. You will never do better. The flesh is always what it always has been, always will be. The flesh, verse 23 says, being born again, you have a new man. You have a Christ, you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. The new man can do this, the old man can't do it. You have to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God in you to, to be able to do these things. Being born again. Your old man's never going to do it, never going to want to do it, never even going to want to attempt to do it. But you've been born again. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. new. You can, I can do all things through Christ. Which strengtheneth me. First Peter chapter four, while we're here. First Peter chapter four. Verse number seven. First Peter four seven. 
but the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. See, that's, it's, it's love between Christians. Have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know what charity does? It doesn't take away sins. It covers them. Guess what? In any relationship, husband and wife, children and parents, church members, guess what? All have sinned. I've sinned against you. You sinned against me. Guess what? I can't take away your sins. You can't take away my sins. As far as our relationship goes, they're there. But you know what we can do? We can cover those sins. In other words, hide them from our eyes, not bring them to the forefront of our attention, not dwell upon them, not bring them up, not throw them in their face. Charity will cover the multitude of sins. doesn't take it away, but I'm covering it. It's not affecting my relationship with you. It's covered. Well, how big of a multitude? Well, one time Peter really thought he was going out on a limb. He said, Lord, how oft shall I forgive my brother? Till seven times? I mean, that sounded like a lot to, me, to him. And, and the Lord said, uh, try 70 times seven. What? Lord, we need our faith increased. <laughs> multitude, you sins. How big of a multitude? Charity never faileth. Never faileth. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse number 12, Colossians 3.12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now, you know why you have to put all these things on? Because they don't come on naturally. They're not there by nature. You have to put them on every day. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Now, why would the Lord tell us to forbear one another and forgive one another if we were never going to have any need of forgiveness? If we were going to never have any need to be forbeared, right? The Lord just takes it for granted. You're going to need to forgive each other. You're going to need to forbear one another. It's going to happen. Not a justification, but it's going to happen. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, that's the key. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Never mind how they treated you. How has Christ treated you? He was merciful to you. He was kind to you when you never deserved it. He's still merciful to you. He's still kind to you. And you fail him every day, and I do too. (laughs) Hasn't changed him. Never will. Verse 14. And above all these things... It's, it's pretty strong, pretty strong. First Peter 4, 8, above all things. Colossians 3, 14, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. The bond, bound. You know what? Without charity, there's nothing binding us together. And you might be here, but the connection is real loose. And if you don't have charity, real easy to walk away. If I don't have charity, real easy to walk away. You know why? Because there's no bond. There's no bond. There's nothing holding you together. We may be here. We may be assembled together. But there's no bond. The bond of perfectness. Perfectness in the Bible. Perfect doesn't mean sinless. Perfect means complete. Complete. You're not a perfected Christian. You're not a complete Christian without charity. Above all these things, put on charity. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. All right, now keep it in the context. Don't isolate verse 15 by itself. Look back at verse 12. 
Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness. Look at the next phrase, humbleness of mind. When someone offends you, when they disrespect you, if you don't have a humble mind, you know what happens? You lose your peace. I can't believe they don't think I'm the greatest. I can't believe that's, this is their real assessment of who they think I am. If they really knew who I am and you just, you just work yourself in a frenzy and you've lost all your peace because you're not humble in your mind. Verse 15, let the peace of God rule. It's there, but you've got to let it rule. You've got to let it have dominion. Not the pride, not the contention coming out of your sinful heart, my sinful heart. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called. And now look at, look at that last phrase, so also so key. And be thankful. You know, when, when you have a problem with someone, you tend to get tunnel vision. And that person, the person you don't like, the person you have a problem with, they are bigger than all of God's blessings. Apparently, because you can't think about God's blessings because you're focused on them. And, and everything God has done for you has been blocked out and put to the back burner and put to the side, and all your thoughts are on them. <laughs> and you're not being thankful. If you would count your blessings, as the song says, and think about all the things that God has done for you, all the things you have to be thankful for, you would really put all this fighting in perspective, proper perspective. God's been really good to me. Uh, get uh, two places. Get um, 2 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Every time I preach something, the Lord tests me with it the next week, so... Here we go. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. 2 Timothy 2, 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. All right, so a lot of things... Lord says, follow here, but for our purposes, charity. Charity. You're supposed to follow it. With that, 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 1, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. So you know what charity is? It's something you have to follow. It's, not, it's something you have to follow after. Because just when you get to the place where you think, well, praise the Lord. Charity is in my heart. God, is, God has been working on me. God has helped me. I have charity. Just when you think that happens, somebody does something else. Somebody does something else. Or you remember what they said. You remember what they did. And that charity that you have attained to begins to flee away. You have to be constantly in pursuit of it. Constantly in pursuit. You've got to follow it. While we're here in 1 Corinthians, look at chapter 16, 1 Corinthians 16. Verse number 14. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all your things be done with charity. So charity will result in action. We'll see that in the next verse but you can do the thing and not have the charity. Let all your things be done with charity. So you can do the right thing. You can go through the motions, but in your heart there's still no charity. You've got to do everything, all things, with charity. I am helping them. I am blessing them. I am being good to them. Yeah, but you really don't care how it works out for them. <laughs> All things be done with charity. And then back to 3 John, back to our passage in 3 John. We'll close here. 3 John, verse number 6. 
3 John verse 6, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. Here's the last thing I'll say about charity. You can't just say you have it in your heart, but nobody sees it. You know what verse 6 says? Which have borne witness of thy charity. In other words, someone is able to testify, yes, he is charitable. Here's the evidence. They can bear witness of it. Here's the work. Here's the action. Here's the evidence. So both sides are true. 1 Corinthians 16 says, let all things be done with charity. So you know what that means? That means you can do the action and not have charity. But on the other side, you can't say, I have charity in my heart, but it doesn't result in action. You can do works, the right works, doesn't mean you have charity. But true charity will result in some action. True charity will result in some works. Charity, it's the height, it's the height, the pinnacle of spiritual maturity. Father, thank you for an opportunity to open up your word. Please help us with these truths. Lord, thank you for being so loving to us. Thank you for being so kind to us. And Lord, I pray that your love would so fill our hearts, we would see ourselves the way you see us, and we would have no problem being charitable to others. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.